Hi class, this lecture is on pit and fissure sealants. So what is a dental sealant? We talked about this briefly when we talked about composites, but dental sealants are an organic polymer or a resin that flows into the pits and fissures of a tooth and it bonds to the enamel surface mainly by mechanical retention. Sealants are um, placed only on the enamel. We're not placing these on any dentin surfaces. Um, sealant material, if you remember we discussed, it is kind of a step below flowable composite. So flowable composites have more uh, matrix to them, they have less fillers um, versus a packable composite, and sealants are kind of just below that. So even less fillers, more matrix, um, so they're not going to be quite as strong as a flowable composite um, because they have less fillers and they're more flowable than flowable composite. The purpose of a sealant is to provide a physical barrier or to seal the pits and fissures on the occlusal surface of a tooth. Um, this prevents bacteria and nutrients from collecting in the pits and fissures, reduces the acid environment necessary for caries, so it's sealing off those pits and fissures, those grooves, so that uh, caries cannot develop in them. Um, it modifies the tooth anatomy, so it makes pits and fissures easier to clean, um, and when we say it makes them easier to clean, it's basically, it's sealing them off. So we don't, we're not responsible now for cleaning in those areas because we're creating a smoother, flatter occlusal surface. Um, and it creates smooth margins at the junction of the enamel surface. The benefits of sealants are that they are uh, economical. So they are a uh, cheap, easy way to seal off the surfaces um, and prevent maybe um, future costs of fillings and things like that. They're safe and effective. They can be placed by a qualified auxiliary staff, um, not just the dentist. So dental assistants um, in Oregon, um, as long as you're an expanded functions dental assistant, um, you can get a sealant endorsement in order to place sealants. Most I would say probably most dental assistants that are employed, high majority of dental assistants that are employed are EFTA. Um, the functions of an expanded functions dental assistant, most offices are gonna want a dental assistant to be able to do those things. Um, and then even though getting a sealant endorsement is in addition to that EFTA certificate, um, most schools uh, like PCC, automatically you get a sealant certificate when you graduate from the program because that course is built in. Um, a lot of programs are like that and sealant courses are um, fairly common, fairly easy to get. So most dental assistants are going to be certified to place sealants. Um, and then dental hygienists are part of your licensure is that you are also able to place sealants because as a hygienist, you can do anything that an EFTA can legally do. Um, dentists must check sealants if a dental assistant places it, but not if a hygienist places it. And in Oregon, dental hygienists can determine the need for sealants um, or prescribe them and then supervise uh, a DA in order to place them. So, um, so a dentist can check if a dental assistant places, but a hygienist can also do that as well. So dental caries. Um, so since the 1940s, the decline in the rate of dental caries um, is mostly due to fluoride. So there has been an overall decline since the 40s, and this is mainly due to water fluoridation. Um, fluoride is most effective on smooth surfaces of teeth, not in pits and fissures. And water fluoridation, although you're getting some topical effect of water fluoridation, water fluoridation is truly more effective. And again, if you've heard something else in another class, I apologize, but water fluoridation is most effective when teeth are forming. So it's most effective when kids are ingesting that water, when their teeth are developing. Um, and it's really about how the, not only is it, it does it affect the way that the enamel forms and the, the um, the chemical or biological makeup of the enamel, but it also makes the pits and fissures more well coalesced. Um, if you've ever seen the difference between a tooth that um, was formed while the person had water fluoridation um, versus non, the, you'll notice that the grooves are uh, much flatter. The occlusal surface is a little bit flatter. The grooves are just not as distinct in a tooth that formed while the person ingested fluoride water. Um, it's really interesting to see. If you've never seen it, um, it's neat. I've had patients before where 
I will look at their teeth for the very first time and I'll say, did you grow up in Portland? And they say no. And I'm like, yeah, I can tell because your teeth look like you had fluoride water when your teeth formed. It's very interesting if you've never seen it, but um, maybe I'll try to find a picture of it online and show you guys. Um, anyway, sorry, that was a little bit of a tangent, but uh, pits and fissures have the highest rate of caries because they're harder to clean than smooth surfaces. So some bacteria will always remain between the sealant. Um, so, you know, it's gonna be, the way that the pits and fissures are, are formed on the tooth, you know, it is gonna be impossible for us to fully clean out those all the bacteria from those areas. Um, but if the sealant is properly placed and it's properly retained on the tooth and it's properly sealing those surfaces, that bacteria that is trapped under there does not enhance the chance of developing caries underneath. Um, so again, this is if the sealant is placed correctly and is properly retained on the tooth. Um, although sealants are effective, it's still necessary to include other preventive measures. So, you know, it's like when a patient gets a crown on their tooth. It doesn't mean that they don't have to take care of that tooth. It doesn't mean that they're not brushing around the crown and taking care of it. They can still get carries around the margin of a crown. It's the same thing with sealants. We don't want patients to think that um, just because they have a sealant, they don't have to take care of their teeth. So we still need to make sure we are brushing and flossing, you know, plaque removal, um, making sure that we are watching our sugar exposure, our carb exposure. We need to reduce the levels of strep mutans and lactobacilli. We can use chlorhexine and xylitol. So again, if our patients are at a high risk and we've determined that they need those interventions, uh, we still want them to use them. Um, sealants are not an alternative to those, um, as well as the use of fluoride in our everyday care. So why are we going to place a sealant? What are the indications for a sealant? Does everybody need sealants? Who needs sealants? Um, newly erupted teeth are on, especially, obviously newly erupted teeth are going to be on kids. Um, so when, you know, at six years old, those first molars are coming in. Um, we want to look at, do we want to place sealants now? as well as when the second molars come in around age 12. Um, so those are times where we want to be looking at those newly erupted teeth um, and then sealing those off before those pits and fissures have a chance to um, get any decay started. Um, occlusal contours where pits and fissures are deep. So we want to be looking at not just do these teeth exist and have pits and fissures, but are the pits and fissures deep or are they shallow? Um, do we think that the risk of this tooth getting caries is high or low um, and whether or not we should be placing them. Um, if the pits and fissures are not deep, if they're really shallow, it's very likely that a sealant won't be retained on the tooth because it doesn't have the pits and fissures to really um, grasp onto. Um, and then if the patient is high caries risk. So we're not just placing sealants on kids, we can place sealants on adults as well. Um, let's say we have a patient that, you know, they don't have any, um, any fillings on, you know, on some of their molars. Um, they have a really low caries risk. They've always been low risk. But let's say all of a sudden they start taking an antidepressant. One of the common side effects is dry mouth, xerostomia. Um, if the patient is experiencing dry mouth, we may want to consider doing sealants on their molars if the molars are, are um, you know, if they have deep pits and fissures. We might want to consider that because that patient is now at a higher risk of caries. Um, so xerostomia, orthodontics, um, even though with orthodontics, the issue is more cleaning of like the buccal surfaces of the teeth, we still want to look at orthodontics can just cause um, an overall lower, uh, lower sense of good home care. Um, so orthodontics can be an indication for placement. Um, and incipient caries. So again, caries are only in the enamel surface. If we've got some incipiency started in the enamel, we may want to seal those off with a sealant. So we know that deep pits and fissures, our toothbrush bristles will not fit into those deep pits and fissures. Um, so we know that we're not gonna be able to adequately clean those areas. So again, sealing them off is gonna help us to clean that surface more effectively. So why would we not place a sealant? What are the contraindications? So if we have caries in the dentin, so if, if, the, if there are caries that have progressed to dentin, we are not gonna be sealing that tooth. Um, proximal decay, 
insufficiently erupted teeth. So if there's an operculum or that little piece of tissue that's kind of, you know, flapping over the distal surface of the occlusal, um, that tooth has not sufficiently erupted. We're not going to place a sealant on that tooth yet. We're going to wait until it has erupted a little further. Um, primary teeth with a short life expectancy. Sealants are not commonly placed on primary teeth, um, although they absolutely can be. Um, but if a primary tooth is expected to uh, exfoliate in, you know, I don't know, depending on the operator or dentist that's looking at the tooth, you know, if we expect it to erupt in a short amount of time, we're not going to place a sealant on that. Um, anatomy of a tooth where the pits and fissures are well coalesced and self-cleansing. So again, we're looking at those pits and fissures and saying, are these, are these pits and fissures at risk of caries? Are they deep? Um, if they are well coalesced and shallow, then we are probably not going to be placing a sealant because not only um, is that tooth at less risk because it's easier to clean, um, but also the retention aspect. Very well coalesced and um, smooth occlusal surfaces are not going to retain a sealant. Um, people with low caries risk, if you have a low caries risk, you know, it's not going to harm the patient to place a sealant necessarily, but you know, we don't necessarily need to be placing them on low caries risk patients. Um, and we want to consider patient cooperation as well. If you've got a six-year-old child that is obviously, you're obviously not going to be able to get them to sit still and maintain a dry field, we're not going to be placing sealants because we're not going to get a good result. Common teeth and surfaces to seal. So first permanent molars, six years old approximately, um, those are probably our most common teeth to seal. Um, we want to consider the anatomy of the tooth, obviously. Maxillary first molars, um, the cusps of carabelli can create a lingual groove that needs to be sealed. Again, every patient is going to be different, but if that first maxillary molar has a cusp of carabelli, we want to be looking at how deep is that groove. Some patients, the cusp of carabelli is um, pretty minor some it's a lot bigger and has a bigger groove. Um, there's a large lingual oblique ridge that divides the occlusal surfaces. Um, you guys have seen that in a restorative when placing fillings and that ridge can sometimes be really really deep and we want to make sure to seal that properly. On the mandibular molars um, the buckle pit needs to be sealed sometimes. And again, we're evaluating each individual and what the anatomy of their tooth is. We can absolutely seal that buckle pit. And usually we just run the sealant material from the occlusal surface right down that buckle groove into the pit. Um, second permanent molars, so around 12 years of age, we wanna be looking at those as well. The lingual pits of maxillary anterior teeth. So this can definitely depend on anatomy. Um, you may have seen a common place, sometimes you'll see older patients that have um, little lingual, on the maxillary laterals, they'll have little lingual pit um, amalgam fillings on those teeth. Again, this is usually older patients, but the lingual pits of the maxillary laterals are a common place for caries to develop. Um, Again, some people have more prominent pits there, but those can be sealed as well. Um, primary molars, um, again, depends on the philosophy of the dentist. A lot of times we're not placing sealants on primary molars because we know that those teeth are going to exfoliate. Um, but if it's a high risk patient, then we can definitely do it because we're preventing, you know, that kid from then having to have fillings later on if we think that they're going to be more susceptible to caries. Um, the bonding is not as strong in primary molars as opposed to permanent teeth. Um, deep cingulum in permanent upper anterior teeth. So again, that's, uh, again, depending on the anatomy. Uh, hypoplastic teeth and teeth with developmental defects or weaknesses. Um, and permanent premolars. Uh, permanent premolars can definitely be sealed. Uh, again, we're looking at the anatomy. Um, these pits and fissures tend to be more coalesced. Um, they tend to be, the occlusal surfaces of premolars um, are not really commonly affected by caries. Usually if we're seeing a, it, if we're seeing caries in a premolar, it's more likely that it's interproximal. So it's more likely that we're gonna end up doing MOs or DOs because we're finding interproximal. 
Usually premolars, we're not doing a lot of straight occlusal fillings because again, those occlusal surfaces, just the way that the anatomy is, they're not as susceptible. So uh, criteria for an ideal sealant. So if we want a good sealant um, that is well retained, we wanna achieve prolonged bonding to the enamel. So obviously we want it to bond and be retained. We want it to be biocompatible with the oral tissues. So we want to look at the material we're using and make sure that it is biocompatible. We want to offer a simple application procedure. Um, we want it to be free flowing, have a low viscosity or be more liquidy, um, capable of really flowing, entering those narrow fissures, have good wetting abilities, um, and have low solubility. We don't want our sealant to um, be soluble. We don't want it to uh, wear over time due to just the oral environment and the, um, you know, the wetness of the oral environment. Uh, classification of sealants. So sealants can be classified by the type of material that they are. They can be what we just call a sealant material. They can be a flowable composite. Um, how the material is hardened or how it's polymerized. Most sealants are light cured. Um, their sealants do exist that are um, self cured. Um, and then they can also be classified by color. So um, most sealants are a very white, opaque material. Um, if you're using flowable, you can obviously get that in different shades. And I have actually seen sealants for kids that are colored. So, you know, rainbow colored sealants you can get as well. Um, three types of materials, filled, unfilled, and fluoride releasing. So, um, all sealant material is going to have some amount of filler. So when we say unfilled, it doesn't mean that it has no filler to it, but it means that it's, a, it's much less and they're much smaller particles, whereas a filled material is gonna have more filler and they may be bigger particles. So again, we're looking at kind of that, um, you know, uh, like a gradient of like, at one end we've got packable composite and at the other end we have an unfilled sealant material. Um, after unfilled sealant material, you're gonna go to a filled sealant material. Then you've got a flowable composite all the way up to a packable composite. So we're, we're looking at, you know, a gradient of filler amounts versus matrix amount. Um, and then some release fluoride and some don't. Again, it's gonna depend on the brand, the type of material, all that good stuff. So filled, the purpose is to increase bond strength and resistance to abrasion and wear. So think filled, you think more filler particles, bigger filler particles, it's gonna make that sealant stronger um, and more resistant to abrasion and wear. The fillers are gonna be glass and quartz particles, which give it hardness and strength to resist occlusal forces. Um, the viscosity of the sealant is increased for flow and if you overfill the pit, um, the pit, the pits or fissures with sealant material, then you're going to need to adjust occlusion. So when we talk when we talk about sealant material, if you know that your sealant material is filled, you absolutely have to adjust occlusion before the patient leaves. You're checking it with blue articulating paper. If the patient is hitting on that sealant, if you're getting any blue marks, you're removing those blue marks with a handpiece. Um, so filled sealants always need to adjust the occlusion because they're filled, um, they're not going to wear away, like the patient isn't going to just naturally wear that sealant away and, and wear their occlusion down, it's going to affect their occlusion in a negative way. So unfilled sealants, they're typically clear, um, they contain no or little particles. Um, they're going to be less resistant to abrasion and wear because again, this is going to be mostly matrix um, and that the fillers are what gives it the strength, um, and so they're going to be less resistant, like I said. Um, they may not require occlusal adjustment when placed. Um, the, you always want to look at the manufacturer's directions again. So even if it says unfilled, we want to read the directions and see what it says. The reason that unfilled sealants may not require occlusal adjustment is, again, they don't have as many filler particles, if any, and so the patient can naturally wear those down. So even if you overfill with an unfilled sealant, um, the patient just um, over over a shorter period of time naturally just um, you know they're in during chewing their occlusion, clenching their teeth, things like that. They will wear that down. 
Unfilled sealants are typically used during community sealant programs because we're not having to adjust occlusion. Um, so they're faster, they're efficient. But again, with an unfilled, it's gonna be less resistant to abrasion and wear. So we're looking at a lot of factors when we're choosing our materials. So, you know, are we placing this in a traditional dental office? Are we trying to, you know, do an entire school of children on a, you know, the tooth taxi or some type of a, you know, community service program um, where we're trying to, you know, do a lot of things in a short period of time and we want to have ease of placement. Those are things we want to be considering. So fluoride releasing. Obviously, if our material is releasing fluoride, we are enhancing caries resistance. We're going to just help that tooth prevent um, future caries. Um, the action is remineralization of any incipient caries at the base of a pit or fissure. And newer materials, the manufacturers are trying to improve retention properties as well. Um, so we want to look at, you know, again, what are we trying to achieve with this? If the patient does have some demineralization, um, if we think there may be some inc incipient caries in that enamel surface, having a product that's going to release fluoride is going to help to remineralize those areas and, um, prevent that tooth from future caries or from that from those caries um, getting larger over time. Different types of polymerization or curing. So we have our self-cured materials or autopolymerization. So with these, we're gonna take two materials, a base and a catalyst, mix them together. Once we mix them, they begin um, a chemical process of hardening. The disadvantage is working time. Once you mix those two materials together, you only have so much time to get them in place. So the sealant can set up too quickly or it can set up too slowly. Remember, no matter what type of polymerization we're looking at, we need to maintain good isolation. We need a very dry field in order for our sealant to be retained properly and make it successful. So if our sealant is setting up too slowly and we're having to you know, keep this field isolated while we're waiting for it to cure, that can affect the longevity of our sealant. Um, Self-cured sealants are not very common, but they do exist. Light cured sealants, photopolymerization. So just like our composites that we're using in lab. Um, so there's no mixing involved. They come in small syringes, just like our flowable composite does. Um, the light helps us control how slow or how quick we want it to cure. So we have some um, a longer working time in order to manipulate the sealant or get it into place and we can cure it as soon as we want that sealant to polymerize. Um, these do require a special ultraviolet curing light. When we say it's a special curing light, it's the exact same curing light that we've always been using, so it's not anything different. Um, but this can, if, if you, you know, Let's say you're, it says it provide, it's an extra cost. It, I, when we say that, we're talking about like, let's say we're working on the tooth taxi. So we've got this community, we've got this bus that drives around the community placing sealants. If that's all we're doing and we're not placing composites, then yeah, it is gonna be an extra cost because we don't already have that light. So we're having to buy that on top of our material. Whereas maybe we'd wanna look at self-cured composites if we don't wanna you know, buy curing lights, um, things like that. Um, so anyway, that's, that's, you know, it's, it's not a new light. This is the same light we've already been using. Um, there's a picture of a light cure unit. I mean, gosh, I really wish we had those, uh, glasses. Those would be cool. I've never seen those before. That is awesome. We should probably look into getting some of those because those are pretty cool. <laughs> All right. Sealant color. So they are available in clear, tinted, and opaque. Um, the purpose of having it be colored is that we can quickly identify um, that it's a sealant on the tooth and we can evaluate whether or not it is, um, you know, the, when we say evaluate the sealant, we're talking about evaluating like not only when we place it, but down the road. Let's say you have your patient comes in for a cleaning, you're evaluating their teeth to see if anything looks amiss. Um, you can easily see because it's so opaque that there's a sealant on that tooth. You can see if part of it's missing. It helps you in seeing the margins of it to see if there could be any leakage. Um, so understanding if that sealant needs replacement or repair, um, anything like that. Um, the color of a sealant does not affect its retention or quality. Um, when we say that, you know, it does depend on the brand. So like if you're looking at the, ex like, the, you know, you have like, I don't know, 
a material and it's called sealant plus and it's made by dense ply okay and it comes in various colors then it's the material is still the same because it's still the same same brand and type of sealant material the color is not affecting it however if it's different brands with different colors you do want to look at that because that could affect um, the type of sealant that you're placing so when we talk about that color not affecting it that would be specific to that brand um, the picture here shows a before and after and it shows like a pink sealant yes there are sealant materials that exist that are colored and they're like fun for kids i guess but this material it's pink when it's placed and then when it's cured it turns white and again this is going to aid in placement so you can really see it stand out on the tooth to know that you're accurately covering the areas and how much you're placing but then once it cures it's white so it blends into the teeth uh, more effectively so determining the needs for sealant we talked about this a little bit in a previous slide um, occlusal caries so we want accurate accurate diagnosis of occlusal caries can be difficult um, it's easy when there are obvious signs on x-rays or by visual detection by visual detection we mean that we're using an explorer we're touching those pits and grooves and we're feeling that stickiness um, diagnose, diagnosis of occlusal decay can be highly subjective um, so it's again it's not always super obvious it's not like this is for sure caries um, it can depend on you know the dentist the operator who is looking at it um, so what are we looking for discernment of fissure opacity changes in the translucency of the enamel um, we can be looking for you know the the telltale sign of caries is going to be kind of that grayness you know the enamel you can kind of see that it's translucent you can see like a grayness through the enamel so there is a change in the translucency um, and opacity of the uh, the enamel around the pits and fissures um, obvious presence of cavitation of the enamel the fissure morphology and discoloration so black or brown um, again i've said this multiple times in the past but discoloration of pits and fissures is not a diagnosis of caries um, it's a sign that we want to look closer at those areas because where there's staining there can definitely be other things um, getting into those areas and when i say other things i'm talking about plaque and bacteria which can lead to caries but we can also just have staining there's lots of patients that have perfectly healthy teeth without any caries no demineralization but they are stained um, so again we're not looking specifically at uh, stained grooves being a diagnosis for caries they're just an area that we want to look closer at so again diagnosing occlusal caries can be difficult um, we we can we can see caries occlusal caries on x-rays it's not as obvious though as uh, proximal caries so we're going to be looking at lots of different things we're going to be looking at it visually so staining of the grooves we're going to be looking at the pits and fissures and how deep they are we're going to be you know checking with an explorer to check for any stickiness obvious cavitation um, and then yeah looking at our x-rays as well so again we want to use a combination so we always want to use a combination of things we're looking at x-rays we're looking at the clinical appearance of the tooth and adjunctive detection technology um, which we i believe you guys learn well okay so this lecture when you guys have this lecture i believe you learned about this the previous friday um, when you looked at sopro and diagnodent um, and you may look at some other sorts of caries detection mechanisms um, i think last week i talked in a lecture i mentioned um, they uh, what did we call i can't remember the brand name of the one that was in the lecture but there are um, products out there that are um, like disclosing solution but for caries and so you can put those um, solutions on the tooth rinse them off and any areas that are stained um, don't aren't they're not a definitive diagnosis of caries but they can point you in the direction of this might be caries so we want to use other technologies and a combination of things in looking at whether or not this tooth is good for sealants um, so what should we seal so unstained and intact fissures so no decalcification or loss of opacity superficially stained fissures that do not indicate dentinal caries so again 
If there are stains, that is okay to seal. We just wanna make sure that we are being as thorough as possible in determining that there are not caries that are into the dentin. Um, we wanna make sure obviously that our bite wings show no occlusal caries um, and use adjunct technology to support our findings. Here is a nice picture. It's a cross section of a tooth and the way that caries progress at a fissure. Um, so how they progress through the enamel and then down into the dentin. Um, oh, and a good thing when we're looking at this, you can see that like the way that they do progress at the fissure is that they're going to progress outward from the fissure. But if you look at the fissure in like picture A, B and C, even picture D, you may not be able to get an explorer down in that fissure even when there's caries developing under it so when we're looking for you know sticks with our explorer our explorer may not be getting down as far as it needs to get to actually feel that i mean by the time we get to um, picture c and d here we should be able to see something even if it's small for you know like picture c we should be able to see something small on an x-ray at those points um, but like picture b you know, we have obvious caries in the enamel and it's getting down into the dentin. That, that level is probably not gonna show up on an X-ray. So again, they can be difficult to diagnose on the occlusal surface. So when do we not seal a tooth? So shallow and well-coalesced pits and fissures. Shallow, well-coalesced pits and fissures are gonna not only be um, less susceptible to caries because they're just not as deep, but also they're not going to retain a sealant as well as a deeper pit and fissure. Um, my teeth, I grew up with fluoridated water and my teeth are, um, my occlusal surfaces are very shallow. Um, the pits and fissures are very well coalesced. I have had sealants placed probably a dozen times and they never last more than a month um, because my pits and fissures are just so shallow. Um, I also do clench and grind my teeth. So I've got multiple reasons that we shouldn't be sealing my teeth, but I've still had sealants placed so many times. Um, but yeah, so you wanna look at how those pits and fissures, um, what the personal anatomy of that tooth is. Um, deeply stained enamel and fissures. So if we see some really deeply stained stuff, that may be an area that we don't wanna seal, again, due to the fact that that's gonna be a higher risk for caries, doesn't mean that it's automatic, but that might be a tooth that we'd want to do like a PRR on. So we want to maybe open up those um, fissures a little bit more, see if there's any caries under there before proceeding with a sealant. Um, we are avoiding fissurotomies in our clinic. When we say a fissurotomy, a fissurotomy just means that we're taking a really small thin burr and we're opening up those grooves. Um, and a fissurotomy is what we're doing if we're doing a PRR, so preventive resin restoration, which we talked about in previous lecture. Um, that's what a fissurotomy is, a small little burr opening up the fissure so that we can um, access those areas a little bit better, get some better retention, check for decay, place our sealant or PRR. Um, and it says avoid sealing dentinal decay. We don't want to be sealing dentinal decay. If there's decay into the dentin, we're not placing a sealant. Oh, and here's a slide on fissurotomy. So fissurotomy, so this is widening of the fissures prior to etching or placing a sealant or a, or a PRR. Um, why would we do this? Again, depends on the philosophy of the dentin, personal opinions. Um, Dentists who are uncomfortable sealing in incipient caries. So remember, we can place a sealant when there are incipiencies in the enamel. Um, that is, uh, the research shows that is completely fine to do. We are sealing off those caries, um, but some dentists are not comfortable doing that. And so doing a fissurotomy, we can remove some of those incipiencies prior to sealant placement. Um, for prevention-minded folks like the hygienist, we prefer no removal of tooth structure. So again, we always want to um, retain as much natural tooth structure as possible. So that's a reason we might not want to do a fissurotomy. There is no evidence that shows sealants with fissurotomies have more favorable outcomes than those um, without tooth structure removal. Um, there are landmark studies that prove sealing incipient caries is acceptable as long as it is placed properly. So again, um, this goes back to my personal opinion on it, but yeah, if you're placing a properly 
placed sealant where you are truly sealing in any incipiencies, you are sealing those carries off from the nutrients um, that they would need to uh, continue to grow. So you're basically, you're sealing off their food source. And if you're adequately sealing that off, then they're not gonna have an opportunity to grow. So again, this all goes back to being well-placed. So in the PCC clinic, um, the patient needs to have recent bite wings. So if they don't have bite wings that are less than a year old, um, we're not gonna be placing sealants. There could be decay present without occlusal clues. Um, so we always wanna be checking bite wings before we're placing a sealant. We're gonna clinically determine that any stain present is not into the dentin. Um, ideally, we're gonna use a caries detection device um, and have the student check prior to placement. So ideally we wanna be using all the tools at our disposal to make sure that there's no caries present into the dentin before placing. If we have any doubt about a surface, we're not gonna seal it. If the grooves are really shallow um, or, not well, or they're well coalesced, we're not gonna seal. Um, and we're gonna document the need on a treatment plan page in the chart. So these pictures, would you seal it? Um, so I'm not 100% sure, but me looking at these, if I'm looking at the top left picture labeled picture C, um, there are some, there is some staining in those grooves. I would obviously feel that with an explorer to see if there's any stickiness. When looking at um, the x-ray, I mean, these are obviously the mandibular teeth. So if I am looking at, I've, I'm feeling like this may not, Gosh, this doesn't even really look like the same. I mean, I'm sh assuming this is this X-ray goes with this teeth. These teeth, the first molar, it looks like there might be some distal decay there. Um, this it's not a great X-ray. It's pretty washed out, but um, it does look like there's some distal decay there on that tooth. So I probably wouldn't be placing a sealant there because that probably needs a DO. Um, and then the meat, I can only see the mesial surface of the second molar, but that's that tooth looks okay so i'd want to obviously check it in the mouth as well um the other side it looks like we are it looks like it's flipped around so picture a on the top obviously there is a very visually that is a very very deep um, groove on the distal um obviously it's got some staining but it also looks fairly wide that groove um, I would guess that if I stuck an explorer into that, I'd probably stick. But then when I look down at that x-ray, tooth number 14 there, um, man, that is, that is a large amount of decay there. And you can see that it's not, not necessarily, there's a little bit of overlapping. It's not necessarily coming in from the proximal, but it is coming in from the occlusal. So it looks like that distal groove is pretty open and we do have some definite dentinal decay going on there. So that would be an, a real obviously a no seal situation. All right, clinical procedures. So general rules, we wanna, this is when we're talking about clinical procedures we're talking about now, we, we actually are gonna be placing some sealants. So we wanna treat each quadrant separately. So we wanna, if we're gonna be working in, um, in the entire mouth, usually we're, if we're placing sealants like on a child, we're, we're doing the entire mouth. Like, so we're doing either um, the four first molars, the four second molars, or, um, or all eight. And we want to do each quadrant separately. This is to really to maintain isolation, give the patient some little breaks, um, but it's mainly for isolation so that we can get a good result. When possible, we want to be using four-handed dentistry with an assistant. Um, a lot of times sealants are placed by um, a dental assistant working solo or a dental hygienist working solo. But if you can get help, you're gonna get much better moisture control, better isolation. You can work faster and more efficiently. You're gonna save time. The patient's gonna be more comfortable. Um, and you're just gonna end up with a better result, mostly because you're gonna be able to work faster and get better isolation. We're always gonna follow manufacturer's instructions for the products that we're using. And the success of retention just depends on precision in each step of the application, specifically maintaining a dry field. So when we talk about each step, we wanna make sure that one, the tooth is clean. Second, that we're doing a good etch process and that etch process is successful. We're maintaining a dry field 
after the etching process and during placement. So each step of the way, we wanna make sure we are working um, as precisely as possible. Steps for sealant placement. We're gonna be cleaning the pits and fissures, making sure that um, if there's a lot of plaque on the tooth, we're removing that. We're making sure things are as clean as possible. Evaluating the surfaces prior to placement, even if they've been previously evaluated, um, especially if you were not the person previously evaluating it, you're always going to evaluate that tooth um, when the patient is in the chair for the actual procedure. We wanna position our patient um, appropriately, isolating and drying the tooth. We're gonna etch the tooth, rinse and dry, apply sealant material, light cure, evaluate the sealant coverage, make sure that um, everything is good. You can, if you've placed a sealant and cured it, and you're ma you've maintained good isolation, if there is a spot that you need to um, add some more or you missed a groove or something, you can add more as long as you've maintained isolation. We're gonna check occlusion as well as contacts. You might say, why are we checking contacts if we're just placing a sealant on the occlusal surface? Very, very common for sealant material to um, either kind of just um, flow into, like it would be the distal contact because gravity is gonna flow distal. You can get sealant material that um, just flows right over the marginal ridge and into the contact space. Um, so you always want to be checking the contacts um, on the mesial and distal of every tooth that you seal just to make sure. It's really easy to remove sealant material in the contact area if um, it accidentally got in there, but we want to be checking it. And then we want to apply fluoride after sealant placement. That's a typical step at the end. So cleansing the pits and fissures, we're gonna use a toothbrush straight into the occlusal pits and fissures and we're going to brush the tooth. So again, we're just trying to remove excess plaque, make sure that the tooth is nice and clean. We're gonna rinse and suction. Uh, we're gonna use the HVE. Um, it says if possible, it's usually always possible to use the HVE, especially if you're working um, with an assistant or you're doing forehanded dentistry. Um, the HVE is just gonna help us uh, suction better and so we're gonna use that. Use our explorer tip to gently remove bacteria and debris from the pits and fissures. So, you know, we are assessing those pits and fissures before we're placing them. Um, if there was a lot of um, debris in it, we'd be, we could use the explorer to help us get that out. Hopefully we've gotten as much out as possible with our toothbrush. We're gonna rinse and suction again um, and evaluate again for additional cleansing. So really we're just saying, we need to make sure that the tooth is as clean as possible. Um, in the past, um, a step to placing sealants used to be to use pumice um, or some type of a, a gritty paste, not a profi paste. Profi paste, um, there's something, I can't remember what exact ingredient, there's something in profi paste that can inhibit the bond of a sealant. But a lot of times um, it, it was said that you should use pumice to cleanse the surfaces to make sure they're good and clean. Um, but new research indicates that that's not needed and that just brushing with a toothbrush adequately is good to cleanse the pits and fissures prior to placement. Um, examine the surface to be sealed. So again, we're using visual tactile radiographs. We're always gonna evaluate at the time of placement, even if a sealant has already been prescribed. We're gonna make sure there's no caries that extend deeper than the enamel. Uh, make sure there's no operculum or tissue that's covering the occlusal surface and um, the sealants have to be recently treatment planned. So it says within 12 months question mark. Um, that depends on, I guess, where you're placing the sealant as in what office. So what the philosophy is your office is as far as um, when they have been treatment planned. Um, I believe at PCC it's still 12 months. I know in the DA clinic um, we try to do six months, but um, yeah, so we wanna make sure that they've been at least recently in quotes treatment plan and we'll see what um, what the DH policy is as well. Um, position the patient. So patient positioning is important for the operator to see clearly as well as maintaining moisture control. For maxillary, for maxillary teeth, uh, we want to position the head low and have the patient tip their chin to the ceiling. For mandibular teeth, we want to incline the chair slightly. If the patient's head is too low, gravity will cause the sealant material to flow too distally. Again, this is a flowable material. So if you place material on the mesial occlusal surface of a tooth and you give it enough and you give it 
time, even just like 30 seconds, it's going to start to flow distally. Um, when Usually when students are placing sealants, when we go to check the bite after placement, the, typical, the most typical spot we're gonna see a high spot is on the distal surface of the occlusal or the distal aspect of the occlusal surface because the sealant material has flowed distally before curing. So um, know that that is something that's gonna happen. So we wanna make sure that we um, try to avoid that. And part of avoiding that is positioning of the patient. We wanna isolate and dry the tooth. So again, isolation is crucial for optimal bonding of the sealant, and this leads to quality of sealant retention. Um, we wanna eliminate all moisture contamination. Even the patient's breath is considered moisture contamination. So if a patient is breathing super heavily, um, that is something we wanna consider. We, wanna we can use a variety of isolation techniques. Um, we want to do whatever works for the individual patient as well as you, the operator. A rubber dam is also always going to give us the best isolation. It's just hands down, that is the best isolation method. However, rubber dam is probably the thing we're going to use the least in isolating for sealants. Um, the main reason is because our patients are not numb for sealants and our patient is not going to want a clamp placed around their tooth if they're not numb. Um, so rubber dams are not usually used for sealant placement, but it would be the best isolation method. Typically we are using cotton rolls, dry angles, and gauze. Um, cotton rolls and dry angles are gonna be the best. The other thing that is really works well with isolation for sealants is utilizing our suction. The um, saliva ejector can be kept in the mouth the entire length of the procedure if if you have an assistant or you're doing four-handed dentistry the assistant could be holding the saliva ejector in the mouth the entire time not only is that going to um, suction up um, saliva that may be pooling posterior to the teeth we're working on but it also acts to um, if you're keeping it close to the tooth you're working on it's actually going to suction up um, moisture from the patient's breathing as well um, while we're working so then we're gonna dry the tooth with clean air. So we don't want any water or oil contamination from like a handpiece or something. Um, we're always going to um, test on our glove or um, we're just gonna, you know, some of you have probably already figured this out, but like if you've um, etched a tooth and you've, you know, uh, used the air water spray, then before you go back to dry the tooth, you always want to press just the air button outside of the patient's mouth. You'll press it off to the side to really clear out the air water syringe of any residual water that's in there prior to drying something. That way you're um, not getting moisture contamination. Um, pictures of isolation techniques. You can see there's cotton rolls with cotton roll holders. You don't need a cotton roll holder as long as you know how to place cotton rolls appropriately. Um, but sometimes cotton roll holders can be helpful. Um, dry angles always as well. So once we've isolated, we're gonna etch the tooth. This is a crucial step in the bonding process. We are always etching. Um, this cr does create irregularities in the enamel. So it's going to um, uh, remove some minerals from the surface. It's going to open up the enamel a little bit. Those irregularities are going to allow the resin um, material to penetrate into those pores and create a better mechanical bond or locking to the tooth. Um, etchant is a phosphoric acid. We have a range of percentages. It comes in gels or liquids. We're typically using the gel that comes in the syringe and it's usually, I can't remember what we have in the clinic, but it's usually a 35 or 38%. Um, do not contact acid etch solution with the gingiva, oral mucosa, or exposed skin. Um, a mild burning can occur um, on mucosa. If exposure occurs, which it does happen from time to time, we wanna flush or rinse the area with water for about 60 seconds. How do we prevent this from occurring? Well, one, you wanna have really good isolation you wanna be really accurate in your placement of etchant material. Um, you guys notice that in clinic, I, or in clinic, in lab, um, our etchant materials, the syringes were super stiff um, and you were putting a lot of pressure on them and sometimes they would just like kind of like squirt out like a little blob of etchant. 
whenever you're etching on a human patient, you always want to take your syringe and you want to squeeze some out off to the side on your tray, like on a two by two before you go into the patient's mouth. And the reason for that is to make sure that your syringe is working properly um, and to make sure that it's not going to squirt out abruptly in your patient's mouth. So you're always going to make sure that it's working appropriately outside of the mouth. Then you take it to the patient's mouth where you have control of it and you know what's happening. Um, after you let your acid etch sit, let me see if the next slide says this. Um, after you let it sit on the tooth, um, you want to make sure that when you go to suction it up, that you are using the HVE. When we are suctioning etchant, we are always using the HVE. If you try to use the saliva ejector, you are most likely going to get etchant on the mucosa um, or the patient's gonna swallow it because the, um, the saliva ejector is not suctioning water at the rate needed to get the etchant out before it contacts the mucosa. So if you're gonna be rinsing etchant off of a tooth, you wanna get your HVE in there you wanna get the opening of the bevel right over the occlusal surface, um, turn it on, and then um, the suction alone is gonna suction the bulk of the etch off of the tooth first. You want that to happen. So you wanna suction the tooth before you start rinsing it to get the bulk off. Then you're using a really good air water spray on the occlusal surface, again, with the HVE right there. So the HVE is gonna suction up everything before it has a chance to get to touch the mucosa or get into the patient's mouth. Um, we can deliver our gel again with a syringe, a micro brush. Um, we're gonna etch for 15 to 60 seconds, depending on the manufacturer's directions. Um, if it's a liquid etch, which is not what we're gonna be using, you would use a micro brush or a cotton pellet. Um, and with a liquid, you are gonna continuously apply it to keep the surface moist, but you're not rubbing too um, hard or too vigorously. Again, we're, most, we're gonna be using the gel in clinic, um, and gel is what is typically used, but liquid does exist as well. Here's a picture of acid etched enamel. It's actually, I think this is actually a picture of dentin, but either way, whether we're etching enamel or dentin, we're opening up the pores. Um, we're going to rinse and dry and thoroughly suction. Um, we're going to dry and then we're going to e examine the etched surface. So a properly etched enamel surface should appear chalky white. If it's not appearing that way, we're going to re-etch it to get that way. Um, after rinsing, we're going to be making sure we're drying it for 15 to 20 seconds. So our drying is going to be long because we are really getting that chalky surface to appear and we want that surface to be really, really dry. In order for a proper bond to occur on enamel, it needs to be very, very dry. So we're going to maintain dry isolation during this entire process. Here is a picture of a properly etched tooth. You can see that it is nice and chalky. It's not shiny. Um, that is what we are looking for. And it should be really, really dry. This looks like a very dry, well isolated tooth right now. Um, applying a bonding agent. So this is optional. Um, I am not sure when this PowerPoint was created, so I am not 100% sure that this is still the PCC procedure. Um, it's not the procedure that we do in the DA clinic, but it may be what's still done in hygiene. So when we actually go to do this, we will obviously make sure you know what the PCC procedure is and what the products, what the instructions for the products we are using are. Um, but at the time of the cre creation of this PowerPoint, um, the PCC procedure was to apply a bonding agent. Um, so studies have shown that application of a enamel bonding resin before placement of a sealant enhances the retention in the seal. So at PCC, um, we apply a thin layer of OptiBond Solo Plus, which is a primer and adhesive in one. We apply it for 15 seconds with a micro brush. Um, lightly air dry it so that it's nice and thin for about three seconds and then it's light cured. Then apply the sealant material. So applying a very thin coat of sealant material, making sure to cover all pits and fissures. You can use an explorer tip as long as it's clean and dry to help the resin flow into the fissures. Um, we don't want to overfill. So you don't want to fill up the occlusal surface. 
you really want to make sure that that sealant material is only in the pits and fissures and you're using the smallest amount possible to actually cover those surfaces. Um, when we see some pictures of placed sealants in this PowerPoint, I'll make sure to comment on what that looks like. But we don't want to overfill because if we overfill, we're just going to end up having to adjust occlusion. Um, we're not applying um, sealant material to the cusps. Um, it's going to interfere with occlusion and we don't need to cover the cusps. We're only focusing on pits and fissures. We want to avoid any air bubbles, so no air bubbles allowed in our sealants. And we want to leave it in place for about 10 seconds before curing. Um, you don't want to leave it too long because, well, what we're doing, why are we leaving it in place before curing? The reason for that is that this is a flowable material. And so after we've placed it, we want to let it settle for a couple seconds because it's going to help it to flow downward into those pits and fissures and kind of even out. However, we want to be careful for how long we let it sit because it is a flowable material and the longer we let it sit, especially if our patient's tooth is not parallel to the floor, so if the patient is lying back, we know that gravity is going to cause that material to flow distally and we're going to end up with high spots on the distal occlusal surface. So we want to let it settle, but not too long. After we've placed it, we are gonna light cure it. So we're gonna point the end of the wand close to the sealant material. Again, we know that we wanna be as close to the material as possible without touching it. Um, and that's gonna give us the best cure, the strongest bond, the best seal. Uh, avoid touching the tooth surface. Um, if we touch the tooth surface with the wand and we touch the sealant material, the sealant material is going to cure to the curing light itself. We always wanna use eye protection, look away from the light. We're gonna cure for 20 to 30 seconds. Um, longer curing time is associated with increased retention. Remember, you can never over cure, so you wanna cure it appropriately. We are gonna evaluate our sealant coverage. So use an explorer, we're gonna check for air bubbles, we're gonna make sure the cable surface margins are smooth. Um, the sealant popping out of the pits and fissures, we're gonna make sure that it's not popping out of the pits and fissures. Um, add additional sealant material if needed, as long as we've maintained our isolation. Um, reseal if needed. If there has been any moisture contamination or we did not maintain isolation and we realize we need to add more material, then we're gonna just re-etch. We don't need to remove the sealant, we just need to re-etch the area that we're going to be placing additional material. Um, when evaluating sealants, we, you don't wanna worry about popping the sealant off. Um, sometimes when people are evaluating, they're worried that they're gonna pop the sealant off. So they're you know really, really gentle when they're exploring it. However, if you can remove a sealant with an explorer, it needs to be replaced. If you can pop a sealant off by using an explorer, it is not well retained. It has not been etched properly. Isolation wasn't maintained. So don't be afraid to really check it because if we can pop it off with an explorer, that means that that sealant would have failed fairly shortly down the road. So don't be afraid of um, exploring it. Um, here's a picture of a sealant placed on this patient. You can obviously see the sealant. It's very opaque. It's very white on the surface. This actually looks pretty overfilled to me. My guess would be if we checked this patient's bite, we'd have to do a little adjustment um, because you can see that the sealant material is quite pooled on the tooth. Um, it's not, it's not, we, let's just say we could use a lot less material. This just looks like there's a lot in there. So we're going to check occlusion and the contacts. So articulating paper is going to show us any high spots. Um, unfilled sealants do wear down. So remember, if we are using an unfilled material, if we check the occlusion and there's a high spot, we don't necessarily have to go in and adjust it with a handpiece because it will wear down fairly fast. Just the patient, you know, their natural occlusion will wear it down. Um, but filled sealant material does require us to adjust the occlusion. So any spots that we are marking, we need to use our handpiece to um, lower them. Um, it says here, use a slow speed handpiece with a finishing burr to adjust. Um, it, depending on how how overfilled the sealant is, I mean, you can use a high speed handpiece, but a slow speed handpiece 
you just you, you're not adjusting so much that you need a high speed hand piece but a finishing burr um like a football would be good um for adjusting an occlusal surface um you can even use like your enhanced polishers like if it's not a if it's not a really heavy adjustment that needs to be made we know that with those enhanced polishers if you put pressure on them, the more pressure you put, the more material they will remove. And those can sometimes be really nice for adjusting sealants because it's gonna remove material, but it's also a polisher, so it can like make sure it's really smooth as well. Um, and it says when you learn how, you can use a high speed to adjust. Um, we'll see, you guys have obviously you learned how to use high speed hand pieces. So um, I'll double check to make sure um, what we're allowed to use when we actually go to place these. Um, you want to floss to make sure the contacts are not sealed together. Again, it's it happens. It's not. It doesn't happen all the time, but it's not uncommon to seal the contacts. If you seal the contacts, the first thing you're going to want to do is grab an explorer and see if you can just pick that material out. Usually you can pop it right out. If for some reason your explorer is not able to pop the material out, the next best thing and the next line of defense is to get a floss threader, thread floss under that contact, pull the floss out. 99% of the time, that's gonna pop it out. So I've never had a sealant in a contact where I wasn't able to use one of those two methods to remove it. Um, we are gonna rinse the patient's mouth out. Um, etchant is really, really gross. It's, it's highly acidic. It tastes like the sourest, acid you've ever tasted it's really gross so obviously when we rinse after etching we're going to make sure we give the patient a good rinse but also at the very end of the procedure um, the resin does leave a sour aftertaste as well so we are always making sure to give a good rinse at the end um, and then the instructor is going to check the final sealant before the patient is done um, when we are checking our sealants um, in the clinic, we're going to make sure that you, the student, have checked and adjusted occlusion and that you have flossed the contacts. So those are always our, our things that we're going to check, as well as making sure, obviously, that the sealant is retained on the tooth. So we're checking with an explorer. Um, this picture of a sealant, this looks like a well-placed sealant. You can see that this sealant material is not really pooled up. It is very focused just on the fissures and pits of the tooth. So we don't have any pooling. So I bet if we checked the occlusion on this sealant, we would be fine. We wouldn't need to make any adjustments. Oh, the other thing, if you get sealant material and you, it's like up on a cusp, um, and you know, if it's on a cusp, it's usually really thin, like it just kind of accidentally got a little bit up on the cusps. The patient will still be able to feel that because it's not normal, but using um, an enhanced cup on the cusp will polish that right off. So not you don't necessarily need to use like a burr if you just have a little residual material up on a cusp, just use a enhanced cup or some type of a polishing cup. That'll get it off really fast. Occlusion. So again, we're going to mark our occlusion. Oh, I, I feel like this might be the same patient we were looking at. But anyway, yeah, if it's high, we're going to go in there with a burr and adjust it. Um, gosh, this looks like they're almost using like a greeny, which is not what you would normally use. But maybe I'm just looking at the picture wrong. But anyway, lots of different burrs and things we can use to adjust occlusion. Um, hand piece adjustment. So here's a slow speed hand piece. Here's a variety of finishing and polishing burrs we can use. I mean, like I said, we're probably not going to be using uh, brownies and greenies because those are for amalgam. Um, but our green stones, white stones, those are really common to use to adjust sealants. Those are really easy. Um, there's also some lab burrs in this picture. We're not going to use lab burrs, but I guess this, they're just here on this slide. So we're not using lab burrs. We're going to use the burrs that we've mostly been using for um, adjustments in lab as well. Um, and when I say lab, I mean like restorative lab. The burrs you've been using to adjust composites are pretty much what we're going to use to adjust sealants as well. Um, and then last step, we're applying fluoride. So fluoride is going to help to remineralize the tooth structure after the etching process. Remember, we're etching 
although we're trying to keep our etch in the pits and fissures, we're basically etching the entire occlusal surface, but we're not putting a sealant over, you know, the cusps and the entire surface. So fluoride is going to remineralize those areas. Um, we want to make sure that even if we've got parent consent, if we're, if we're working on a child, if we've got parent consent for sealant, we also want to make sure we're getting consent for fluoride because some parents may be opposed to that. Um, in community programs, again, we're always getting parent permission for both sealants as well as fluoride because they are different procedures. Um, this can be a barrier for ch children to getting sealants. So many um, school and community programs can may admit application of fluoride. Um, and at the time of this presentation, we would we did PCC sealant day and brought kids in, and we did not do fluoride at our sealant day for this reason. Chart documentation. So we always want to um, record, did we use any sort of um, adjunct caries detection method and what was the result? Um, what type of isolation did we use? What tooth numbers that we, we wanna note that we acid etched the tooth. We wanna note the manufacturer and brand of the sealant material. Any additional items such as difficult to isolate number three, anything that, would, that impacted could impact the outcome. Um, we want to note that we did fluoride treatment. This does not mention um, the step of bonding, but if we do bonding, we also want to note that we used bond and what brand. So maintenance of sealants. So we are always reevaluating. So anytime we have a patient coming in for a recare, we are going to check their sealant retention the same way we would check all their restorations. You know, we're always checking to make sure everything is holding up. So we're checking that the sealant is retained. We're going to check for any underlying caries progression. This is rare, but if there is a leaking margin on a sealant, caries can um, occur underneath of a sealant. If um, part of a sealant has been lost, we can repair it. Um, and it says, although it may appear that a sealant is lost, the material can remain deep in the pits and fissures and the micro spaces can still be protected. So if a sealant, if it looks like a sealant isn't there, it could be that it is just worn down to the place where we can no longer see it and it can still be existing in the pits and fissures. Um, highest rate of sealant loss occurs within the first five years. So yeah, if a, it's again, kind of like goes back to that whole don't be scared to check a sealant with an explorer because if you can pop a sealant off with an explorer, it is most likely that it's going to fall off pretty soon anyway. All right. Well, that is the end of our sealant lecture. Um, let me know if you guys have any questions about that. Um, we will be placing sealants at some point during the term. Um, I haven't looked at the schedule. It might be, you know, next week or today. So um, I'm not sure when, but um, let me know if you have any questions about the lecture and I will be happy to answer them.